you got to be careful about it. Learn. Yes. Well, good evening, everybody. It's time for us to get started. We are in Genesis chapter 43. Genesis 43. And on Sunday, we went through Genesis 42. We saw where the, uh, the plot starts to thicken, essentially. Uh, so Joseph has come to power in Egypt. That was chapter 41. And now we finally get Joseph's life uh, intersecting with the lives of his brothers again in chapter 42. Because we know the situation. The situation is that there's a famine in the land. It's going to last for seven years. And it's going to be a very severe famine. And so the brothers go down to Egypt. Uh, we've noted how that sets an ominous tone for the whole story because it makes us think back to Genesis 12 and Abraham and Sarah going down to Egypt. Uh, we've seen how Joseph treats them harshly. Uh, he speaks to them harshly and he treats them like foreigners which puts us in mind of the way that Laban treated Jacob. And in fact, we're going to see one more really big reminder of the way that Laban treated Jacob in the next chapter, chapter 44. And we're supposed to see this connection between the way Laban has treated uh, Jacob and the way Joseph is treating or planning on treating his brothers. Um, let's see. So they come before Joseph looking to buy grain. And he accuses them of being spies. And they say, no, 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 we're not spies. We promise we're not spies. And he says, well, here's what's going to happen. You are going, because he questions them a bit, and he says, you're going to come back with your youngest brother, or else you're spies. And then he sends them off, and he sets them up. Uh, and this is, this is the end of the chapter. How does Joseph set up his brothers? Yeah, he gives them all the money back, which makes them what? Thieves. And you know what the penalty is in the ancient world for theft, for thievery? Well, it depends. Now, usually, uh, sorry? Now, sometimes it can be loss of a hand. Um, sometimes, and we'll see this in the Law of Moses as we actually get into the laws, um, sometimes the, the repayment is, uh, basically you pay back the same thing several times over. Um, so you could pay back threefold, fourfold. Um, in some of the laws of Hammurabi, in some instances, it would be as great as tenfold. In certain circumstances, um, it would lead to death, but not any of the ones um, that we're looking at here. Uh, at least not in this chapter. Uh, the ancients had some pretty interesting laws in that regard. Like if, you, if your neighbor's house caught fire and you went to help your neighbor get all of his stuff out, you know, save it from the fire, and you saw something that looked really, really nice and you decided to pocket it, you know, to take it for yourself while you're helping your neighbor out in the fire, and you are caught in the act, the law of Hammurabi prescribes that you were to be thrown into the fire. Um, now, there's one other really prominent instance where theft is punishable by death. We've not seen it. We've not seen it yet in Joseph's story. We have already seen it in Genesis, but we are going to see it again in Joseph's story in chapter 44. Um, so just bear in mind that the ancient world, they, the ancients took theft very, very seriously, and this is the way that the brothers take it. Uh, whenever they open up, uh, if you go to chapter 42 and verse 27, as one of them opened his sack to give his donkey fodder at the lodging place, he saw his money in the mouth of his sack. He said to his brothers, my money has been put back. Here it is in the mouth of my sack. And how do they react? Yeah, they panic. They do not see this as a positive thing. They don't think, oh, boy, those Egyptians sure are nice. They are, they're frightened. Their hearts failed them. They turned trembling to one another, saying, what is this that God has done to us? They, this is so bad that this looks like a divine curse to them. And we're going to see this same sentiment repeated in chapter 43. Um, the idea that they all know that... 
the way things stand, they are going to be accused of theft. And they discover whenever they finally get home that it's actually much, much worse because it's not just the money in one of their bags, it's all of their money. The entire thing has been returned to them. Uh, and they are just certain that they are going to be outed for criminals. Um, and of course, to pile on top of this, what have they been accused of? Yeah, they're accused of being spies. So now they're spies and thieves. Yeah, and so they're trying to prove that they are honest men. And now they've discovered the money in their sacks. How on earth are we ever going to prove ourselves to be honest men now? Um, and so they get back home. The very end of the chapter... Verse 36, Jacob their father said to them, You have bereaved me of my children. All right, the word bereaved here uh, is the word that's used throughout the Old Testament for, for miscarrying. Right? Say so if, uh, if a woman miscarries or um, if your flocks miscarry, it's the same word here. In other words, you're, you're caused to be bereft of your offspring, your children. That it's a special kind of grief. You have bereaved me of my children. Joseph is no more, and Simeon is no more, and now you would take Benjamin. All this has come against me. Then Reuben said to his father, Kill my two sons if I do not bring him back to you. Put him in my hands, and I will bring him back to you. All right, we talked about this on Sunday, the offer that Reuben makes. He doesn't, uh, the offer that he makes is still serious. You know, to lose his two sons uh, would be a very, very serious blow. Uh, that would essentially cut him off in his lineage. Um, but he's not offering himself. But Jacob said, My son shall not go down with you, for his brother is dead and he is the only one left. All right, and we noted this on Sunday as well, just the level of favoritism here. He's the only one left. You know, the, the other nine of them are standing around thinking, well, what are we, chopped liver? If harm should happen to him on the journey that you were to make, you would bring down my gray hairs with sorrow to Sheol. And remember, that's the same thing that he said about Joseph at the end of chapter 37. You know, you're never going to comfort me. I'm so sad I'm going to go down into Sheol. I'm so sad I could die, Jacob says. All right, so they're in a very, very bad situation. Um, and, <clears throat> excuse me, um, all of this comes about in a way that is, there's, there's a symmetry to the whole situation. Because remember, Jacob, or sorry, uh, Joseph has been sold um, into slavery in the land of Egypt. And a result of that is he spends a lot of his time in jail, in prison, in the pit, um, depending on uh, where you're looking at in the text. Um, now, they don't know that he has spent all of his time in the pit. Although, well, they know about the little bit that they put him in the pit, but they don't know that his, most of his time in Egypt has been spent in the pit because they are dishonest men. And remember the offer that Joseph makes them. This is the situation he has put them in. If you are honest men, you will leave one of your brothers behind, take the grain home, bring your younger brother back. It's a test. Are they really honest men? They've already sold one brother into the pit for a sum of money. Will they sell a second brother for an even greater sum of money? Now, we get to see the answer here at the end of the chapter. They want to go back. Joseph doesn't see this, obviously. Um, but it is Jacob that prevents them from going back. And that's going to continue uh, at the beginning of chapter 43. Any questions or comments before we pray and then jump into our text for tonight? All right, let's bow together. Righteous Heavenly Father, thank you for the great gifts that you've given us today. Thank you for our time together to study from your word. And thank you, Father, for uh, these stories from your servants, the patriarchs. Help us, Father, to see the reform in them. Uh, we see, Father, how, um, how the brothers have changed. Uh, we're going to see how, uh, specifically, some of them uh, change in some significant ways. And we recognize, Father, that with you, all things are possible. Uh, that with you, it is possible even for a sinner to change. It is possible for a sinner to be pleasing to you. 
mostly through the gift of your Son, Father, because it is entirely on His blood that we depend for our righteousness. Thank you, Father, for sending Him to live among us, uh, to die as a perfect sacrifice because of our sin. And thank you, Father, for the glory that you have demonstrated in His resurrection. And Father, we await that day. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. All right, Genesis chapter 43. Now the famine was severe in the land. And when they had eaten the grain that they had brought from Egypt, their father said to them, Go again, buy us a little food. Excuse me, but Judah said to him, The man solemnly warned us, saying, You shall not see my face until your brother is with you. If you'll send our brother with us, we will go down and buy you food. But if you will not send him, we will not go down. For the man said to us, You shall not see his face until your brother is with you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Israel said, Why do you treat me so badly as to tell the man that you had another brother? They replied, The man questioned us carefully about ourselves and our kindred, saying, Is your father alive? Do you have another brother? What we told him was an answer to those questions. Could we in any way know that he, was going, that he would say, Bring your brother down? And Judah said to Israel his father, Send the boy with me, and we will arise and go, that we may live and not die, both we and you and also our little ones. I will be a pledge of his safety. From my hand you shall require him, if I do not bring him back to you and set him before you. Then let me bear the blame forever. If we had not delayed, we would now have returned twice. Then their father Israel said to them, If it must be so, then do this. Take some of the choice fruits of the land in your bags and carry a present down to the man, a little balm and a little honey, gum, myrrh, pistachio nuts, and almonds. Take double the money with you. Carry back with you the money that was returned in the mouth of your sacks. Perhaps it was an oversight. Take also your brother and arise, go again to the man. May God Almighty grant you mercy before the man, and may he send back you, uh, your other brother and Benjamin. And as for me, if I am bereaved of my children, I am bereaved. All right, let's start with that for now, um, because we've got a lot of setup here. Just right out of the gate, we can see, again, just, just pointing out the level of favoritism that Jacob has here for his sons. May he send back your other brother <laughs> and Benjamin. There's one of them that he names, and the other one is just the other one. All right, but let's, uh, we'll start at the beginning here. Now, the famine was severe. The famine was heavy in the land. So we start, just like we started, um, well, we ended 41 and started 42 with this notice that the famine is heavy. It is severe everywhere. Um, that it's still going on and that it is, in fact, getting worse. And Jacob uh, decides finally to send his sons out again. Go down and buy us a little bit of food to eat. Um, but Judah refuses. And notice the way that he frames this. He's, he's very insistent on it. He essentially says the same thing like three or four times over. The man solemnly warned us, saying, You shall not see my face unless your brother is with you. All right, so don't come down unless the brother is with you. If you will send our brother with us, we'll go down and buy you food. But if you will not send him, we will not go down. All right, so a second time he said it. But really, he said it two more times there, just once positively and once negatively. If you send him, we'll go. If you don't send him, we won't. We can count those separately. For the man said to us, you shall not see my face unless your brother is with you repeating exactly the same thing that he said at the beginning. So just really drilling it into Jacob's head. We cannot and we will not go down unless Benjamin is with us. And then Jacob, oh here he's given the national name Israel in verse 6. Israel lashes out at them. Why did you treat me so badly as to tell the man that you had another brother? Remember, when we were going through Genesis 42, we... 
uh, we said that they kind of spill their guts, essentially. They start, they start telling him stuff that really doesn't seem necessarily relevant to the situation at hand. It says he's accused them of spying, and he's repeatedly accused them of spying. And they want to convince him that they are open, they're honest, they're transparent. They're not here to sneak around and spy out the nakedness of the land. In other words, they're, they're not there to take advantage of some vulnerability in Egypt. And they're going to demonstrate that by making themselves vulnerable, by volunteering this information. Um, and it gets used against them. And Jacob says, well, why on earth did you do that? You, know, you think about who Jacob is. You know, trickster, master swindler. It's like, do you, are you guys a bunch of idiots? Why on earth did you volunteer this information? Did you not know how it could be used? And they respond, well, the man questioned us carefully about ourselves and our kindred, saying, is your father alive? Do you have another brother? What we told him was an answer to these questions. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, that's... Um, if we were to go back to chapter 42 and see how that exchange goes, we'll just say that the, the sons are framing things in a way that's very friendly to their point of view. Right? Because Joseph doesn't just spontaneously start asking them, do you have a younger brother? Right? It's the sort of thing, it, they bring it out spontaneously once they're accused. Uh, but we'll pass that over for now. What we told him was an answer to those questions how could we know that he was going to say, bring your brother down? So there's no way we could have known that this, this Egyptian lord, Zapanath Paneo, was going to do all of this. You know, and, and why would they think that Zapanath Paneo would have any sort of interest in their little brother? They've got no reason to think that. This must seem really bewildering to them, that this Egyptian lord has any kind of interest whatsoever in their little brother. Um, of course, it's probably also bewildering why he would accuse them of being spies in the first place and how the money has shown up in their bags. But notice what Judah does. Verse 8. Judah said to Israel his father, Send the boy with me, and we will arise and go, that we may live and not die, both we and you and also our little ones. And notice the way that Judah frames things here that um, as they've been talking with Jacob about sending Benjamin down, there's a possibility that something bad can happen to Benjamin, that he could, some harm could come to him. And Judah, in essence, says, well, yeah, something bad could happen if you send Benjamin down, but what's going to happen if you don't send Benjamin down? We're all going to die. Benjamin's going to die too. We're going to die. You're going to die. Benjamin's going to die. Our little ones are going to die. Um, I, the, the word that's used here for little ones is a, uh, it's an onomatopoeia. You know, it, words that sound like the thing that they're describing, you know, like boom and snap. Hebrew has, a, has an onomatopoeia for toddlers. Um, it's, I think it's pop pop. I'd, I'd have to look at it again. Um, but it's, it's meant to be reminiscent of the pitter-patter of little feet. You know, all of our little pitter-pattery ones, all of our toddlers, they're dead if you don't send us down. Right? He phrases this in a very, um, a very sympathetic way. It's all, they're all going to be dead. Verse 9, I will be a pledge of his safety. Uh, compare that with Reuben. What does Reuben offer? His two sons. Yeah, kill my two sons if anything happens. Judah says, put it on me. I will be a pledge of his safety. From my hand you shall require him. If I do not bring him back to you and set him before you, then let me bear the blame forever. If we had not delayed, we would now have returned twice. All right, so Judah is offering himself... And in doing this, he's doing something really, really risky. All right, because he's, all right, so he's the fourth born brother, but we've already been given indications in the text that he is going to be the chosen son. All right, because the three ahead of him have done things to seriously offend their father. Um, do you all remember what Reuben did? 
what did Reuben do to his father? This one, this is like a little one verse th reference that we passed by. Honestly, I don't even remember in what chapter. Um, yes, with Bilha. Yeah, with uh, with Le um, I forget which maid it is. Um, but he uh, he goes in to Bilha, um, one of his father's wives. Which is, it's more than just a, a giving into lust. Whenever somebody goes into their father's wife, um, just uh, take for example in Second um, Samuel, in Absalom's rebellion. You remember what Absalom does whenever he goes into the city? You know, David has been driven out. Um, and his house is empty except for ten of his concubines. Um, and he has left behind some advisors as well. And one of the advisors starts giving advice to Absalom. And he tells Absalom, uh, go out on the roof. We'll set up a pavilion for you. In other words, make a public spectacle out of this. Make it where everybody can see. And go into your father's concubines. It's a power play. And that's what he does. He does it right in front of everybody um, as a means of securing his hold on the throne. And this is typical for the ancient world. Uh, what Reuben is doing is, again, he's more than just giving into lust for Bilhah, um, who's a generation older than him. He's making a power play on the house. So Reuben is out. What about Simeon and Levi? How did they offend Jacob? Yeah, they killed all those people. The, the whole city of Shechem in Genesis chapter 34. They are on the, on the outs with Jacob as well. Um, in fact, we're going to see this, com this type of complaint come up again um, shortly. But right at the end of Genesis 34, Then Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, You have brought trouble on me by making me stink to the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites and the Perizzites. My numbers are few, and if they gather themselves against me and attack me, I shall be destroyed, both I and my household. All right, so Simeon and Levi both have done things to bring serious offense to their father. Um, and as we'll see later on in the book, they are going to be cut out of the blessings, or at least they're, uh, they're going to receive blessings, like more along the lines of, you guys are really rotten. <laughs> um, it's only Judah, it's going to be Judah who's the first one towards the end of the book that Jacob says something good about. And Judah's putting that, he's essentially putting that up at stake. Require it from me. If I don't bring him back and set him before you, let me bear the blame forever. <laughs> All right, and this is going to be the first of several acts of Judah that we're going to see, um, where Judah kind of takes the lead in a good way. All right, what was the last? Where was the last time that we saw Judah? What was the last thing that we saw Judah doing? Do y'all remember the story's mostly been about Joseph up to this point, like chapter 39, when he's in Potiphar's house, chapter 40, when he interprets the two prisoners' dreams, 41, he interprets Pharaoh's dreams, 42, we've seen him charading as Zaphonat Panea, uh, concealing himself to his brothers. The last time that we saw Judah was in Genesis 38. And you all remember what Genesis 38 was about. Judah and Tamar. How does he end that chapter? I mean, obviously for the bulk of that chapter, Judah is the primary sinner. Right? He is, he's trying to get out of his responsibilities as a patriarch. Um, he is abusing Tamar by not giving um, Shelah uh, to her as a husband. Or rather the other way around, giving her to Shelah as a wife. Um, he goes in and uses it. Well, he doesn't know who she is, um, but he goes into her thinking she is a, a cult prostitute. But how does that chapter end for Judah? Hmm? Well, she had twins, yes. Yeah, Perez and Zerah. But you said that she was more righteous. Yes. Yeah, she is more righteous than I am. 
Uh, that's chapter 38, verse 26. Judah identified them and said, uh, identified the, the marks, the signet ring, the cord, and the staff. He identifies them and said, She is more righteous than I, since I did not give her to my son Shelah, and he did not know her again. In other, unlike Onan, who is constantly taking advantage of her, Judah doesn't. He repents, and he doesn't sin anymore with her. And we're going to see how things pan out for Judah. Uh, we're going to see how Judah's character stacks up over the course of this chapter. All right, but here we've got a, a really good first indication that Judah's volunteering himself. So in verse 11, their father Israel said to them, If it must be so, then do this. Take some of the choice fruits of the land in your bags and carry a present down to the man. Uh, that word also means offering. Take an offering down to the man. A little balm, a little honey, gum, myrrh, pistachio nuts, almonds. Take double the money with you. All right, so they're going to take an offering and they're going to restore the money that was sent back to them. Yes, Wayne? Yeah. Yeah, well, they've got, so they've got things that would have been common to their land, uh, but things that you're not going to, like, you're not going to live just off of honey, pistachios, and almonds. I mean, if it comes down to it, and that's all you have to eat, that's better than nothing. <laughs> yes, Miss Judy. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. The grain is the staple. Yeah. Absolutely. And that's, and that's part of why they're doing as well as they are. They are insanely rich. We've got to remember that. That all of these, from Abraham on down, these are insanely rich men that we are reading about. And over the course of their stories, they just get even richer. Because God is behind them and blessing them. Mm hmm? Hmm? Yeah, but again, what are you going to feed the animals? Right? So they've... Yeah, it's, it's one of those things that, you know, they've not quite gotten to the point um, of, say, like, Depression-era uh, America, where, you know, people would... Because you, know, you had, you know, droughts and famines going on at that time as well. Um, and if your crops weren't producing, you couldn't care for your cow or for your horse anyway. And so, you'd know, slaughter your horse and eat it. Uh, they haven't quite hit that point, it doesn't seem... But they're inevitably going to get there very quickly if they don't go down and get some grain. Because the grain is a staple for everybody, for the people and for the animals. Yeah, Ms. Judy? Yes. Right. Yes, yes. They were hitting that point where they were, I mean, we could almost literally, I think, say, scraping the bottom of the barrel. Um, because, yeah, we're told that the food is run out. Um, and, yeah, when that happens, you're, the, the situation can go south very, very quickly for them. And that's, and that's Judah's point, yeah. If we hadn't delayed so long, if we hadn't been talking about this... It, you remember at the beginning of chapter 42, uh, Jacob's the one who says, at the end of verse 1, why do you look at one another? In other words, what are you guys doing standing around making faces for? Right? He's accusing them of being lazy. You know, get up and act. Here, Jacob is the one that has to be stirred into action by Judah. If we hadn't been bickering about this, we could have been down there and back twice over already. We'd be done with this. We would be okay. So, fa so uh, their father Israel finally concedes and says, yeah, let's do this. Take this offering down. Take double the money, verse 12. Carry back with you the money that was returned in the mouth of your sacks. Perhaps it was an oversight. Now, notice that for a second, what Jacob says. Perhaps it was an oversight. Y'all get what Jacob means by that? He, does, he doesn't say, perhaps the Egyptians will think it was an oversight, you know, as if he assumes that that's what it was. 
He just says, perhaps it was an oversight. In other words, what's, what's still an option on the table for Jacob when it comes to explaining how his boys came home with all this money and the grain? Jacob thinks they actually might have really stolen it. Perhaps it was an oversight. As in, he's not completely convinced of that himself. Because, again, think of who they are. Think of who these people are. Um, I mean, Jacob, yeah, and where they come from. They are truly Jacob's sons. They may not be as clever as he is, um, but they are, they've shown themselves to be deceitful. We've seen that in Genesis 34. Um, we've... And of course, Jacob doesn't know this. He, they don't know that, uh, he doesn't know that they were the ones plotting against Joseph. But we know that. Uh, we know what kind of people generally they are. And we suspect that that has uh, come out in other points in their lives. Where Jacob is not wholly convinced that his, uh, his sons are innocent little lambs who have been framed. Maybe it was an oversight. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. Yeah, if <laughs> yeah. yeah. And what's you know let's see. I need to go back and review this again as I'm studying ahead. I don't recall Jacob whenever things do finally come out, I don't recall Jacob spending a whole long time being fussed over that, to be honest. I mean we'll we'll come to it when we come to it. At this point, Jacob is just interested in getting them down there, getting all of them back, uh, including Simeon and especially Benjamin, and having some grain to survive the famine. Um, so they're going to send an offering, they're going to send restitution money, and they're going to send extra money to buy more grain. Perhaps it was an oversight, he says. Take also your brother and arise, go to the man. All right, then verse 14 is really, really important. We have to remember Jacob's words, basically for the rest of the chapter, um, and some of them for the rest of the story. May God Almighty grant you mercy before the man, and may he send back your other brother and Benjamin. And as for me, if I am bereaved of my children, I am bereaved. So... What happens, happens, in other words. But notice the blessing that he invokes on his sons. May God Almighty, may El Shaddai, grant you mercy before the man. Excuse me, may he send back your, brother, your other brother and Benjamin. Yeah, well, and, it's, this is, and this is something that we've seen. It's interesting about Jacob. Jacob uses some unique names for God, uh, particularly for Genesis. He has, up to this point, he has called God the fear of Isaac. We only see, them, we only see that out of him in Genesis that I can think of. Um, this is the first time that we have seen El Shaddai. Now, there are other places later in the Old Testament where we will see El Shaddai, but it's from Jacob that we hear it first. And this is a unique name for the God of Israel, El Shaddai. Uh, there's, there's no ambiguity about this. It, and so far, up to this point in the Joseph story, it's only Jacob and the narrator who have used unambiguous names for the God of Israel. Uh, names where there's no, no ambiguity, no possibility for confusion whatsoever. He invokes the, his God, the God of Israel. May God Almighty grant you... All right, two things he names. Mercy before the man, and this we need to keep track of for later in the chapter. Um, the word for mercy is the same as for compassion. Uh, and it's, you know, it's something like tender mercies, good feelings. Um, but may God, may God Almighty grant you mercy before the man, before Zaphonat Panea, the Egyptian lord. And may he send back your other brother and Benjamin. All right, so that's the second blessing that he invokes. May El Shaddai bring back 
Simeon and Benjamin. And as for me, if I'm bereaved of my children, I am bereaved. What happens, happens. All right, so that sets us up for the rest of the chapter. Any questions or comments at this point? All right, so now they get the plan into action. <clears throat> Verse 15. So the men took this present, this offering, and they took double the money with them and Benjamin. They arose and went down to Egypt and stood before Joseph. When Joseph saw Benjamin with them, he said to the steward of his house, Bring the men into the house and slaughter an animal and make ready, for the men are to dine with me at noon. The man did as Joseph told him and brought the men to Joseph's house. And the men were afraid because they were brought to Joseph's house. And they said, It is because of the money which was placed in our sacks the first time that we, uh, that we are brought in, so that he may, he may assault us and fall on us to make us servants and to seize our donkeys. So they went up to the steward of Joseph's house and spoke with him at the door of the house and said, O oh my Lord, we came down the first time to buy food. And when we came to the lodging place, we opened our sacks, and there was each man's money in the mouth of his sack, our money in full weight. So we have brought it again with us, and we have brought other money down with us to buy food. We do not know who put our money in our sacks. He replied, Peace to you. Do not be afraid. Your God and the God of your father has put treasure in your sacks for you. I received your money. Then he brought Simeon out to them. And when the man had brought the men into Joseph's house and given them water, and they had washed their feet, and when he had given their donkeys fodder, they prepared the present for Joseph's coming at noon, for they heard that they should eat bread there. All right, so... They go down, they stand before Joseph, and the first thing, they are brought into Joseph's house, which being brought into the house of a high lord like this, uh, it carries all of the weight behind it of, say, having to go to the principal's office or having to go to your boss's office, except instead of, you know, you might get a paddling or you might get fired, it's you might get killed or you might be taken slave. Right? Imagine all of the, I mean, if, and I, I don't think I'm the only one who's like this, any time that you're called into the boss's office for anything, right, you immediately, like, your stomach sinks. Like, what? I, I, I didn't do anything. <laughs> Why am I being called into the boss's office? Or, you know, going into the principal's office. You just feel like, it, it's not a good sign. Those are some of the most discouraging words you can hear. I need to speak with you in my office. Um, and hope, I think you've all felt that before, um, if you've ever been called into an office. Uh, except, like I said, in this case, Joseph has the power to do literally anything to them. And that's why they immediately lose it. When they see that they're being brought into Joseph's house, of course they don't know it's Joseph's house, when they see they're going into Zapanat Panea's house, they say it's because, they're afraid, and they say it's because of the money which was replaced in our sacks the first time that we are brought in. And then they start disaster thinking. So that he may assault us and fall on us, that is roll down on us, to make us slaves, and our donkeys, too. All right, uh, Joseph's going to take everything, and they are going to be made slaves. All right, now again, this all goes back to the frame-up job that Joseph did at the end, uh, or in the middle of chapter 42. He, put the, he ordered his steward to put the money in the sacks. And whenever you're doing something like this, you can't tell exactly how somebody is going to react. Uh, but we do have to notice the, the appropriateness and the, the symmetry of the way they have reacted here. Because of the money, what do they think is going to happen to them? They're, well, maybe not necessarily off with their heads. They're going to seize us. They're going to violently assault us, not to kill us, but to do what with them? To enslave them. Y'all see the symmetry in that, right? Because, ah, uh, yeah, it sounds, yeah, this does sound like a familiar story, doesn't it? 
They are afraid that they are going to be enslaved. And again, there is just some, uh, there is some wonderful symmetry to this. It is appropriate in a way. Um, or at least it seems appropriate, maybe, to us, that they are sweating in just this particular way. And so, they come up to the steward of Joseph's house at the doorway, and just like they did with Joseph, they begin to grovel. And they do it in exactly the same way. They were addressing Joseph as Lord. My Lord, you know, your servants have never been spies. Well, they do the same thing. Oh, my Lord, we came down the first time to buy food, and when we came down to the lodging place, we opened our sacks, and there was each man's money in the mouth of his sack, our money in full weight. So, we have brought it back again with us. In other words, see, we're making this right. We are making restitution here. We are not criminals. Please, whatever you believe, we are not criminals. Would criminals bring the money back? Look, here it is. Plus, we have brought more money. Now look at all this money we've brought. Uh, they're trying to ingratiate themselves to this guy and save their own skins. And remember, this is all a result of what Joseph has done to them. Let's see. So we brought it back with us. We brought down other money down with us to buy food. We don't know who put our money in our sacks. And then the steward gives this wonderful response. Peace to you. Shalom, y'all. Shalom. Do not fear. All right, these are words that we're used to seeing on the mouths of angels. Right? Whenever they appear before man. Do not be afraid. Do not fear. Peace to you. Your God, and here's something really spectacular. Your God and the God of your father has put treasure in your sacks for you. Um, now again, uh, like we have seen, here we see the steward using, or at least in the interpretation. Um, so remember, we've seen already that there's an interpreter acting between uh, Joseph's brothers and the Egyptians. Um, but at least in interpretation, it comes across as Elohim. Your Elohim and the Elohim of your father has put treasure in your sacks for you. Um, now again, this guy could be referring to pagan gods, and I think more than likely that's the way it would have been interpreted, especially coming from an Egyptian steward. Your gods and the gods of your father. Um, but um, the, the phrase Elohim Avicha, the God of your father, is something that we don't normally see. Um, at least not coming out of pagans. Now we do see, you know, the God of our fathers, the God of your father. We see that identification all over the place in the Old Testament, talking about Israel's lineage of faith. You know, uh, the Lord your God, the God of your fathers. He's done this, that, and the other thing. Um, so here, we're given just a, a little glimpse of, again, it, I doubt that they would have interpreted the steward um, as delivering them an oracle of God, and I don't know that we're necessarily supposed to do that ourselves. But we've got this little phrase that, again, is you never see it out of the mouth of a pagan, um, the God of your father. And he says, he's put treasure, or they have put treasure, in your sacks for you. I received your money. All right, so he works to put them at ease. So we, we don't think that you're thieves. Don't worry about that. Now, as we're going to see, they are not fully put at ease. Uh, we're going to see that here in just a little bit. Um, but he brings Simeon out to them. And when the man had brought the men into Joseph's house and given them water, and they had washed their feet... <clears throat> Excuse me. And when he had given their donkeys fodder, they prepared the present for Joseph's coming at noon, for they heard that they should eat bread there. All right, so they're given a nice hospitable welcome. All right, their feet are washed, uh, their donkeys are put up and fed. Excuse me. They're given a comfortable place in the house, um, and they're given time to prepare their offering for Joseph. 
Um, and the steward has at least, again, given them some sense that they're not going to be accused of theft. But as we're going to see in the next passage, they are not yet at ease. All right, any questions or comments before we wrap up the chapter? Yeah. Yeah, it, this, the best that we know is that he was imprisoned. Um, possibly in Joseph's house, probably in the royal prison that Joseph in, himself had been kept in. Um, we're not really told anything about Simeon's time in Egypt up to this point. Now we do know, we're going to find out um, a little later on, that the famine, at least whenever we reach this time marker, the famine will have been going on for two years. Uh, because Joseph is going to say there are still five years left in this famine. You know, so bring everybody down to Egypt so we can take care of everybody. That's going to come in coming chapters. But yeah, he's, he's not been there a short time. It's not like they stayed there a couple of weeks or a couple of months and went back. We're talking a year to two years that he has been in prison in Egypt. Uh, let's see. All right, well, we are out of time. So we're going to have to leave that last little bit in suspense. I tell you, let's just, we'll finish by reading the, or the rest of the chapter. We'll see how they react. We'll see how things go. When Joseph came home, they brought into the house to him the present that they had had with them and bowed to him to the ground. And they, he inquired about their welfare and said, Is your father well, the old man of whom you spoke? Is he still alive? And they said, Your servant, our father, is well. He is still alive. And they bowed their heads and prostrated themselves. And he lifted up his eyes and saw his brother Benjamin, his mother's son, and said, Is this your, your youngest brother of whom you spoke to me? God be gracious to you, my son. Then Joseph hurried out, for his compassion grew warm for his brother, and he sought a place to weep, and he entered his chamber and wept there. And he washed his face and came out, and controlling himself, he said, Serve the food. So they served him by himself and them by themselves, and the Egyptians who ate with him by themselves, because the Egyptians could not eat with the Hebrews, for it is an abomination to the Egyptians. And they sat before him, the firstborn according to his birthright, and the youngest according to his youth. And the men looked at one another in amazement. Portions were taken to them from Joseph's table, but Benjamin's portion was five times as much as theirs. And they drank and became drunk with him. All right, so we're going to end there. But I just want to finish with this observation. We have already seen the fulfillment of the first of Jacob's blessings. Because... What does Joseph have for Benjamin? His compassion. And it's exactly the same word. His compassions are warmed in him, we're told. It doesn't seem like something that he expects. And he has to leave the room on account of it to weep. And so just as Jacob has prayed, may El Shaddai show you mercy before this man, they have been shown mercy before that man. All right, so we'll finish it there. Thank you so much for your kind attention, your questions, and your comments this evening.